This is this three degrees ministries is something that I think the Lord wants to do. I think He's probably asked somebody to be qualified to do, and they're not doing it. And it's not that I needed another thing to do. I mean, we, we have a full time ministry. Steve has a full time uh, job in ministry, doing doing what he does. But I think we're so insufficient and we're so deficient at reaching people and discipling people because of, I explained that X, Y, Z, because we're not pouring into people directly and they're not doing the same thing. We're losing out. And statistically, if you want Barna's latest research, it's a, I don't know, it's maybe over 100 pages, research on the effectiveness of pastors in the church. They just did this in 2017. We're not very effective in, I think it's, I think it's even in the back of our, our flyer. Do I have one of them laying around here? Yeah. I'm actually a very serious person. I really am. Um, I'm actually very introverted, honestly. I don't like to be demonstrative, but if you were to just say things, then that doesn't get attention. Right. And it doesn't really transform anybody because there's no influence impact. See, when, you, when you're when you going to talk to somebody, you have to have emotions involved into it, and then you have to have some understanding of logic involved into it in order for it to be remembered. Otherwise, nobody can remember what you say. No, that's why nobody wants to listen to the guy that goes blah, 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 blah. You know, I mean, we just tune out and fall asleep. So we have to do those things. It's not because, uh, is it an act? I don't know. It's kind of who I am sometimes. It's a gift that the Lord given me. But it is a tool to reach people. Because the people that I deal with have been They've been through uh, several treatments where someone has tried to get their attention by what they're doing wrong. So many times, professional people, I'm not a professional counselor. I, I got involved in drugs when I, was, when I was born because my dad was involved in that. I grew up, got sober at 14, been sober ever since. It's 33 years. I've spent 4,000 hours in jails in prisons, ministering. I started a church from a county jail. I mean, I know what I'm talking about when it comes to this. So we have to get their attention. And someone, someone is so stuck in their lethargy and they're so stuck in mess, you have to shake them up. You have to do something to get them out, right? So Steve has this these slides about how you get in debt. Well, to some one person, ten thousand dollars in credit card debt. Oh my gosh, how would you ever do that? I remember thinking that until I was ten thousand dollars in credit card debt. <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. And so it is like the proverbial frog being boiled. He just doesn't know it. Right. Right. In fact, the Pharisees even said to Jesus in John eight that <coughs> we're not in bondage to anyone. Yet they were in bondage to Rome. Mm -hmm. so, so we are. We are in bondage. It is... Some people think I think it's funny, but it's not. To disrupt things. I'm, I'm here to disrupt stuff. I'm here to make, it, make things uncomfortable. I'm here to make people uncomfortable. On purpose. So that we change. See, if you can face reality, then you can change. If we never get to the point where you face reality, you'll never change. There's no reason to do it. We can still tell ourselves lies and believe them and feel comfortable. Let, let me do these statistics. I got a lot to do this this afternoon. Um, Seventy-six percent uh, pastors know at least one pastor whose ministry has been closed because of stress. Twenty-five percent of pastors will experience problems in their marriage and parenting. Forty-six percent of pastors have faced depression. Fifty percent feel loneliness on a regular basis. This is according to Barna, <clears throat> 2017 study. Nineteen percent have struggled with addiction. Can you guess what addiction that is in pastors? 
It's definitely. It's pornography. Bringing the word of God because there's nowhere to turn, no one to talk to. They turn to pornography. Pornography is always there. And it's an answer to the problem of I feel bad. So 19%, 20% of pastors have issues with addiction. This is the ministry. If that's the ministry, what's the church doing? What demonic forces and what things are, is the pastor allowing into the church through that? And we wonder why we're not effective. We don't wonder. That is why it's the, a reason we're not effective. We're allowing things as our answer. Sometimes it's people. Sometimes it's things. We're allowing other things other than God to meet our needs and then we pass that into our church. There are some pastors who pastor churches who feel comfortable and they're in their position and they only have five years to retirement and so they're just going to don't rock the boat. <clears throat> the whole county or the whole city can go to hell but don't rock my boat because I got my I got my 150 people, I got my 500 people. We're good, right? Yeah. Well, it happens. Isn't that great? 25% <clears throat> of people say pastors are not credible. This is according to Barna. 5 to 12% of evangelicals and non-evangelicals tithe. 5 to 12%. Uh, so that's evangelical, non-evangelical churches. So we're out here trying to be influential, taking our city for God and the whole thing, yet we're missing out on basically 85% of the provision that we're supposed to have in order to do it. Well, it's no wonder we don't have the resources. What is it? People and money to do what we want to do. We can have, a pastor can have a vision to go, let's do this. But if you don't have the people or the money, you are not doing it. And if you do try to do it, it's going to be awful. What do we do? <clears throat> um, a national survey this, uh, by the Barna Group among people who described themselves as Christian and involved in a church discovered that only 5% of the church does anything to hold them accountable for integrity, biblical beliefs, and principles in their life. 5%. This is according to Barna. So it's maybe not this church, but this is, this is the church. So we say the American church. We're not very influential. Why is that? Five percent indicated that their church does doesn't do anything to hold them accountable for their biblical beliefs, principles in their lives. How can you? If you have a church of a hundred people, there's no way one dude is going to be able to be involved with a hundred people on, a, on an intimate level. It ain't going to happen. This is why we're failing. So we have to change this. This is the whole reason we, I wanted to do this in the first place. And I, and I really believe it's God ordained because of some of the things that have happened, some relationships that, that have been made. But but very, very, very seriously, if you look at your comfort zone and you're in a comfort zone, how does it feel? You asked. Okay, comfort. What else? What else is in the comfort zone? Huh? Did I hear peace? Yes. Yes. 
Peace. What else? Someone's doing your job for you. <laughs> what? So, you're being enabled. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, Jesus, no you're a good one. No responsibility. No responsibility. What? Familiarity. Familiar. What else? Safe. What? Safe. It's safe. Yeah. That's why it's comfortable. Safe. What else? Dun, 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 dun. Apathetic? You know he's right. Apathetic? Is it two P's? No, one. A-P-A-T-H-I-C. Apathetic. It's stable. It's what? Stability. Stable. Stable. Change. Yeah. Isn't that great? No There's no challenge to it. Oh, come on, you're... No fear. No fear. Last night, <clears throat> when we started, I was nervous as all get out. Because I said, this is stupid. This is a bad idea. Everything is fine. Go home to Wisconsin. You don't need to do this. Nobody's going to listen. This is really not going to change anything. Look, you're in a little cramped room and you got, can't even go back and forth. All this stuff starts going through my brain. Does it go through your brain? Yes. Hey, we're human. At least we're alive. But guess what? You get up and you say, here we are. And it's uncomfortable. Just because we feel the emotions of uncomfortable, does, what does that have to do with it? God has a mission. He has an assignment. He's going to get his work done. And you are the people he's going to use to do it. Unless there's a whole busload of other people coming to Iowa to come and live, this is what he's got to work with. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> they are moving here in droves. There's a lot of foreign license plates here. <laughs> but this is what he's got to work with. You. And if you don't do it, you don't influence this area, who's going to do it? You were born for such a time as this. Now, if you look outside of the comfort zone, what's it like? I'm going to do this one right now. Uncomfortable. Okay, so we know it's going to be uncomfortable, so the genius that wants to come up with that one, I just took away your... your cha it's challenging. <clears throat> It could be some strife. Unpredictable. Unpredictable. Rejection. Rejected. Rejected. What? Rewarding. Uncomfortable? Outside of the comfort zone? Yes. It's rewarding? Kind of masochist are you? <clears throat> it's gonna be risky. Maybe it'll work. Work. <laughs> work. What is it? Commitment. Commitment. Oh, jeez. Adventurous. Resolve. Resolve and adventurous. Yeah, I wanted to see if Kyle, because I was going to point at him. Not in the eye, so. Has. No standardized work. 
No easy answers. Oh, no easy answers. No. Does it take a plan to live in your comfort zone? <laughs> no, it doesn't take a plan. <laughs> and, and what's obvious, right, is that life is happening outside our comfort zone. And every single one of us battle this. It's not the devil. It's, it's our growth. We can say, oh, the devil's really coming against you. It, it, he's already done it. He's already come against you. He's already, it's already happened. He's already done all he's going to do. He's doing that even when you're in comfort zone. He's trying to, what he's trying to do is shrink your comfort zone. Absolutely. To get you to not leave and leave the house. <clears throat> so, we decide, because you cannot change anything. This is what Steve was saying this morning, is you can't change that debt ratio unless you decide to do it. Unless you make a decision for Christ and go the other way, you, we're all just going to look just like the world. And then we're ineffective. Who is it? Can you think of five people that you're, you're working with right now where you are pouring into their lives? At least five. On a regular basis, you meet at least once a week because you go two or three weeks without meeting with somebody. You might as well not even know one another. <clears throat> Yeah. Okay. Everybody I work with. See, see yeah, what happens is if you can't be with them in the good times, what makes you think they're going to trust you in the bad times? Right. And what we say is, well, I'm going to just wait until things go and then I'll, I know who to reach out to. Well, sweetheart, if you're not already reaching out, if you don't already have these relationships already formed, the chances of you reaching out to that person are very small. So we need to make a decision to leave this comfort zone and do something else. But what do you do? Huh? Well, that's what we say. We, we that's exactly what we say. We step out. So, so we have a desire for things to be different, and we step out. And then, what's the natural thing of stepping out? <laughs> Device. We need a device in order to step out with. If you don't have a device, you can't step out. And then, that's going to reach your destiny. So, you have a desire. This is what we should do. You have a device. This is how we're going to do it. And that's going to fulfill a destiny. Isn't that great? Which is the, what's the matter, Randy? You, 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 is it the spelling? You can't see it? Just trying to figure out where I'm at. Which of these is most important? You got to have a desire. If you don't have a desire, you know, if no one has a desire... To get sober in my my work, I can't help them. I'm like, go use drugs, because that's going to solve your problem until you come to the point you got you want to listen. <clears throat> so you got to have a desire, and we want to see the destiny. How many of us can see where it's supposed to go? But then when it comes to like, how do you get there? 
It's like Jerry Savelle used to say there's amen, and then there's there it is, but what is all that stuff in the middle? Right? So, does anybody have a goal or something they'd like to do in the next three months? What is it? Work. Work? <laughs> Okay. How about another? Here's the thing. When you raise your hand and then I look at you, that means talk. <laughs> Grow my business. Grow your business. To what? To, uh, I guess you would say self-sustaining profit so I do not have to work or uh, work another job. You want to work so you don't have to work. Well, who are you working for now? We are all working for ourselves. Whether you go punch a clock someplace or not, you're still working for yourself. How about, I understand what you what you mean. What? <clears throat> How about another one? Five years ago, I stepped into a position that I wasn't qualified for. And God was pushing me to do it. And I've spent the last five years working 10 or 12 hours a day. And I have not gone out speaking as much as I would like to. Evangelistic meetings. And I would like to do that more. You would like to get out and speak more evangelistically in the next three months. How much is more? I would love to travel constantly. Give me, give me a meeting one to, one to two times a week. I two meetings see, a week. I want to see people saved and set free and healed. Let's do another one. Oh, over here on this side. No, wait. I got a point. I got a point. Um, I want to be more specialized in my business and um, more specific uh, and obviously more financially stable in my business because my business goes like this. Yeah. Highs and lows. And so I want it to be better i just want to improve it so it's not so up and down um and i just want it to be more in line with what god wants which i believe is more specialized and more different than what majority of people do in my line of work what we're going to do before we leave tomorrow if you come back if i don't run you off today <clears throat> steve won't he's nice um is define more because it's, a, it's an erroneous term that doesn't have any meaning. If we have a church of 50 people, we want to grow the church so people are more impacted by God. We just want to disciple people so they feel more of the presence. It doesn't mean anything. It sounds really good. It sounds very spiritual, but it means absolutely nothing. <clears throat> because we can't quantify it. And it's not that we're wrong. I don't, and if you think I'm picking on you, I'm not picking on you. It's just you can't quantify more. There has to be quality and quantity. So we have 50 people, and I asked Josh, his son, last night, I said, How long do you think it'd take to grow this church to 250 people? What do you think he said? That's not what he said. <laughs> he said three years. Because who you have to become to handle that is going to take time to develop. And so he said three years. I said, I was thinking two and a half. So yeah, you're about right. <clears throat> to get to 250 people, it's going to have to take about three years. Now let's reverse that. 
Let's reverse engineer that back to where we are today. What has to change? What we change now is going to affect tomorrow. So what you did several months ago is affecting today. A leader should never be living in this respect in the moment. A leader, you know, when I'm looking at River City Recovery Ministries, personally, I'm at least nine months down the road. What's going to happen? Where are we at? Just for, for that ministry with addiction. That's where I'm at. What are we doing next summer? That's kind of where, I'm, where my mind is. So when someone crashes our van today, it doesn't make any difference because I'm already gone. And I don't have to get upset about it. We'll have a van down there. Someone crashed her van yesterday, or this week. <clears throat> a resident of the... I'll tell you the story. But I don't have... Watch the video. But I don't have to be upset about it today. So it's called future pacing. You pace yourself into the future to where you want to be. So what's happening right now just tells you it's your evaluation of how well you've done. If you don't like it, change. But you at least have to look at it. You at least have to face it. If we don't know what's in our checkbook, we can't change it. If we don't know what's going on, if you don't know it, then you can't do anything about it. You need to know. So... <clears throat> would, how long would you say, if you have a group of five people that you have as a leadership team, how long does it normally, would averagely, on the average, take to mold a team to think that kind of way? Say, okay, starting next week or our next leadership meeting, we're going to be talking about taking this ministry to 250 people. Yeah. What does that look like? And we brainstorm and we talk about it. And we, they all have different departments, so they got to think about their own departments, meet their own teams, blah, 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 la, la, well, la, la. First of all, I come from y'all where conception <laughs> is fun. To be able to conceive what this is supposed to look like, that's fun. Oh, yeah. How is this supposed to be? Mm -hmm. To get everybody looking that direction. Your all's job is, this is where we're going. This is what's going to happen. Y'all paid your dues. And no need to sit and struggle anymore. And, and none. This is, what, this is what's happening. I'm looking. That's where I'm going. Now, if y'all are on the ride, or if you decide to go ride somebody else's bus, we still love you. But this is what's happening. The people are in the 380 corridor that are going to take that ride. That I know. And that's what's going to happen. So, <clears throat> it depends on the competency and it depends on the level of competency that you need. So, I have a meeting that we do Every Monday morning, I do a house meeting, and it's evaluation of how the week went, what's personally going on in each person's life, and is there anybody fighting about something, or is there any issue we have to fix? And so because there's a... We invite dysfunction into our community. So I'm bringing in people who have had felonies. I'm bringing people from prison. I'm bringing people who have had their kids taken away. You know, it's, it's a lot of dysfunction. And they all have to live together as, as part of the ministry. But our, our uh, house meeting is something that I've run. And I've, I've run it ever since I've done this well over 10 years. Is we look at each individual and we have to find out, okay, if it's your turn to speak and you give account for what you've done, I'll ask questions on how or what you see. I'm not going to tell you what to think, 
but I'm going to ask you questions so that you can think. You don't let people get out without being able to think. So you ask questions. You don't tell them what to do. I don't really tell anybody what. I say, I got two rules. Don't have sex with one another because we have men and women and don't do drugs. That's what I tell them to do. That's basically all my rules. <clears throat> There's, we have three homes. Nobody lives. There's no staff in the home to make sure they're not naughty. They, they do it themselves. I appeal to their goodness. And most of the time it works. But they give account. Now, in order to accurately understand what's going on, if you've ever argued about the dishes, it's not about the dishes. If you've ever argued about a surface issue, it's not about the surface issue, right? So you have to accurately discern what's going on. Just so we discern what's going on. Now, I have two, two ladies that help me with this. One's 29, and, and they've both been through our program. The other one's 40. And it has taken well over a year to train them to where they don't get opinionated. See, some people want to put... You want to put your own conviction or your own standard on somebody else. Like you've had the same experiences that they've had. Well, you haven't. We haven't had those same experiences. So we have to have compassion, a point of compassion, and understand that, you know what? When you've been raped multiple times and abused, that you might have trust issues. And it might manifest somewhere. Well, this is something we have to, we have to understand. And so we provide a safe environment where they can come out and they can say, this happened, this happened, this happened. Now, we don't get real deep with that. But we get to a point where they can go to a, a family-based therapist and go to an actual there's Christian therapists that work with us. Then go to the Christian therapist and work that stuff out because it's very deep and it's very personal. But if you're going to, you haven't been raped and you're trying to relate and you're trying to say, we need to get this done, it's not going to work. Does, does this make sense? You get it? So you really have to first see where they're coming from. It's the old saying, you got to seek first to understand, then be understood. So for that, it's taken over a year just to train on that area so they can run that meeting. Otherwise, people clam up, they say, I'm good, and they never deal with the causes of what's happening, and they, they don't get sober. They don't change their life. Their life's not transformed. We have to get it all out. We have to do that. So when, you, when you're doing that, that's, it depends on the competency of what you're doing. Some things, you know, if you're going to, Take someone to the store. Well, that's not very much. You, know, you can figure that. The store's over there. <laughs> just, just go. Don't be 100 miles off of where you're supposed to be. So, back to this device, <clears throat> right? Desire, device, destiny. Yes, they're all important. However, let, let's see. Uh, is there about seven, eight people that would like to experience breakthrough? Okay, I will need them to come up front. And this is why I needed the room changed. Now. Yeah, you can go over there on that side. You can go on that side. What is it, Hebrews 11? Where it says we're surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. There's only four people that want to break through. Well, it's got to be more than four. Yeah, yeah, we're, we're good. We're good there. All right. All right, now we're good. Dun, da, da, da. <laughs> here's, here's what I know. Unless, listen now. This is important. If there was anything important, this is important. Unless a demand is made, there's no reason for it to manifest. 
So we have to make a demand. Unless the demand is made, there's no reason for it to manifest. So we have to put ourselves in a position where the demand has to be made. Right? Okay. So you spoke about the River Jordan. What happened there? They went across to the Promised Land. When were they supposed to go across? This is going to be good. <laughs> when were they supposed to cross the pro to the Promised Land? Two to three weeks after they got out. About two to three weeks. How long did it take? Four years. Okay. Why are we waiting 40 years to touch the wall? So this can be over as soon as you want it to be over. So, what we're going to do is cross this Jordan. Go from one side to the other. And what I want you to do is talk about, think about what it is you want to have happen in the next three months, in the next year, what your goal is. And then I'll ask you what your goal is. And then we'll do it. And so, we need a leader. Who wants to be the leader? <laughs> wait, 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 wait. That's not what he asked. He said, who wants to be the leader? All right, you be the leader. You get to be first. Woo! Yeah, we need it. Yeah, you need the microphone. Da 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 All right. So what I said was, who wants to be the leader? Not look to, oh, well, Tom is the leader. I better. So you're going to be the great cloud of witnesses that help them go across. Now we're going to start here because that's where you are. And we're going to go to about here. You think you can make it from here to here? From there to here? Yeah. All right. Good. I didn't want to overdo it. The only thing is, you can't walk. You can't jump. You can't crawl. And let's pick one more. Wait, define crawl. Which crawl? No, there's like three different types of crawl. Oh, okay, we can, we can, we can crawl. We can, or, or can't walk, can't. Wait, well, you, you can't walk and you can't run, and you can't, you can't. Well, you can, you can, you can roll. This is a holy rolling church. And then you're gonna go from here to over there. All right. So, what is it that you want? Like for my goal, yeah, uh, to bring more people to God through my business. To bring more people, how many? Fifty. To bring fifty people to God through your business. In one year. In this year, fifty people to Christ and through your business this year. All right, you ready? Yeah. Ready? Go. <laughs> Cloud of witnesses. <laughs> Cloud of witnesses. Hey. Good. All right. You made it across. Next. What is it that you want? Now, the only thing is, you cannot copy what someone else just did. Stay there. That's what I was going to do. I'm going to. Yes, I am. What is it you want? I want a clear vision. Clear vision, all right. Clear vision. Here it goes. Go. Go, 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 go. Come on. Up. Let's go. Let's go. What do you want? Let's go. Independence. What? Independence. Independence. Like work for myself. Independence. Go, 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 go. Go, go. Go, 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 go. Grow my business. Grow your business. Go, 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 go. I'm not point at you. <laughs> Next. No, we can't do it again. Remember? No, yeah, no. Uh, 
Uh, get married and have my son. I mean, <laughs> have, have full custody. Go. Go. <laughs> go, 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 go. That's the first time something like that's ever happened. All right, next. Come on. You Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Full Come on. Full-time ministry. Full-time ministry. Full-time evangelistic full-time ministry. Full-time evangelistic ministry. Go. 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 Cloud of witnesses. Come on, man. Uh, bring, you know, evangelize more. Evangelize more. Go. 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 I got to make sure I don't step on. I want more than one thing. I want a kids point pastor. I want a youth pastor. I want an, an executive pastor. And I want a church of 500 people. Go, 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 go. <clears throat> All right. Okay. Now, if, if we started and we said, okay, yeah, go, go across, uh, hop across the room, how would that feel if you were just doing it by yourself? It would feel like, oh. But when you do it all together, how does it feel? Doesn't it feel better? It's kind of exhilarating. It's so exhilarating. Let's do it again. Except for you can't do the same thing you just did. Ready? Go. 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 I want my ranch. 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 Go. 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 I want my mountain. I want my mountain. Go. 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 I want my blessing. Go. Oh, my breakthrough. Go. Yeah. Go. 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 I want my family saved. Yeah. I want my Yukon 2019 black on black with the, with the, with the, um, what's the kit? Yeah, the XLT, but yeah. Go. No miles. No miles. I want to get along better with people. I want, you know, this is what I want. I want my shadow when I walk down the sidewalk, if it falls on people, I want them to cry out for the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what I want. All right. Go. 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 That's kind of walking. All right. Give everybody a hand. Woo. <clears throat> Have a, have a seat. That dude's a trip. He is a trip. He tripped. He tripped, and Tommy goes, he's doing that on purpose. There is power in doing things together. There's power, and you'll see yourself doing things you never would have, could have, thought of, would have done had you not had the team to do it with. When we're all looking foolish together, then all of a sudden, we're not so foolish. It wasn't until you put a demand. See, this device really doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. We got across all sort of different ways. But we still got across. What? I got two. <laughs> we got across. Look, I'm still on. That cracks me up. Nothing happens without the challenge. Yeah. Let, okay. Challenge. And we wrote it somewhere else, no too. Challenge. No challenge. Yeah. 
Nothing happens without that. Huh? Well, I think that just symbolizes accountability. Yeah. How so? Because there are other people stepping out, and so when people watch you or do it with you, you're more likely to follow through, being accountable in the church ministry. Yeah. And so it's fun. Sorry. It's not a chore. It's not like, oh, you did something wrong. Let's everybody look at you. No, everybody was doing something, and and some people are going to fall down, and it's it's oh, it's okay. It's all right. Everybody made it. Isn't that great? It is. It's great. Everybody made it across. What else? <clears throat> Got anything else in this? If it's not super long. No, it's really short. <laughs> I mentioned five. It's not long. I mentioned about five years ago when I was I stepped up into a, a different position at the company that I work for. And when I had done that, I was sitting there in my home going, Oh my gosh, what did I just do? Because I am not qualified. So you, you, you go, yeah. and you guess what? In the beginning, it's probably going to be horrible. Can you live with that? First time I preached, I was still in Bible school. I came up to Wisconsin. They're like, oh, Jerry Savelle Bible School students going to come preach. And there was probably 25, about this many people. I started going, and 20 minutes in, literally half of the room got up and left. <laughs> and I'm still like blah 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 <laughs> and then shortly after he sent me to prison not to live but to, to minister <laughs> and the, the door shut in the sally port and the Lord said there now they can't get away <laughs> that's what I heard they can't get away alright so you put the demand and the device is going to show up. But without a strong enough demand, without a compelling vision, you'll never see how to do it. Without a compelling vision, you'll never see how to get there. Unless we are, what, is it, what does it say in Timothy? Stir yourself up. Unless you're stirred up, unless you really believe this is possible to do, you won't step out. Because <clears throat> everything against you will, will hold you down. So the God in you, the pressure in you, has to be greater than the pressure coming against you. And it's like you're a submarine. The pressure on the submarine wants to crush it, but because there's pressure within the submarine, it holds together. So the pressure in you has to be greater than the pressure on the outside that you'll step out. If, you, if we're not that way, well, I don't see how to do it. Grow. Do the next thing. Do the very next thing right in front of you. That may be the thing that opens the next door. God rarely gives us the entire vision all at once. Normally, to me, it's been, you do this step, and then you do this step. In the beginning, the steps are very small. Now the steps are about a year, year apart. So I can see a year down. And it's, there's some people that said, they have 30 years mapped out. And there's some people, and this is where God is, he's multi-generational. He thought of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He thinks of Timothy, or Paul, and Timothy, faithful men, and others. He's always thinking multi-generational because this goes way beyond our gifts. This goes way beyond what we can do. 
It's not only what we can do, but it was God doing through us. And he does think generational. So the first thing when we learn something, we hit this mental ascent where we go, OK, I understand the concept. That doesn't mean we get it. Just because we understand the concept of how to be disciplined in money doesn't mean you, you're doing it. There's another concept. There's more to it. And that's application. There's a huge gap in between what you know to do and what you actually do. What we say when we, we know we're supposed to cut the calories or eat right or do this or that, we say, well, this time I'll, or I'll just start tomorrow. Or I'll, we, we make up a reason, we buy the reason, that's self-deception, we deceive ourselves and never develop the discipline necessary to get where we're supposed to be. You're still held accountable on Judgment Day for what you ought to have done here. Your mandate is the same, whether you followed through on it or not. Yes, but I did all these other things. If that isn't what the Lord has called you to do, if that's not your assignment, it doesn't really matter. Actually, you could say it's sin. Because we're not doing what the Lord told us to do. And so we live our lives off of the mark. Well, it's no wonder we don't receive the promised land when we live so often off the mark. Now, how you do one thing is how you do everything. So if your relationships are goofed up, it's probably your finances are goofed up because the whole thing is goofed up. But when the pattern's right, the glory falls. Yes. Mm -hmm. Isn't that amazing? So this application is essential. Now, who's responsible for application? You are. Grow up. Once you've applied it, had a working knowledge of it, now you're ready to take the next step, number three. What is that? Huh? The next step is teaching. Who are you teaching? Now you will learn more by teaching than you will by applying or by mental ascent. So, levels of learning, mental ascent, we learn, we develop new things, new concepts and new ideas, which is important. We start to apply them. We're not going to be good at them in the beginning. It's going to look a little weird, like going across the room. But the more we apply them and get proficient, remember when we started driving? You know, it was both hands in the wheel and, you know, full concentration. Now you talk on the phone, eat a hamburger and, and everything else going down the road. <laughs> we, we just developed proficiency in it. And then teaching. We're not here for ourselves. It's only by teaching and modeling that we fully discover the depth of what we know. And again, you know, it holds us accountable. If I've got to teach, I can't be a hypocrite and come in front of my team and not know what I'm talking about. I can't go to the bar the night before and then come to my team and tell them about God. I can't be looking at boobs on YouTube or porn tube and then come to my team and say let's pray I can't do that I think some people have it better than others and I know women are very proficient in a in a meter that tells the truth um, some people might call it a BS meter In other words, you can spot a phony. 
right? And so you look at him and you're like, nah, that guy don't know what he's talking about. And you're like, shut off what they say, right? Yes, sir. But if someone's genuine, honest, open, you're like, okay, I'll, I'll receive that. So it doesn't matter, you know, it doesn't matter what you say, it's how you say it. So when you're teaching, if you really want the church to grow, if you want anything to grow, if you want your business to grow, the more people teaching, the faster the growth. <clears throat> the more people teaching, the faster the growth. <clears throat> because this says we have gone through mental ascent, we've gone through application, and now we can do demonstration. What is Romans 12 to? That you might prove or demonstrate the will of God. So you, you'll be able to prove it, demonstrate it, show how is this done. This is discipleship. It's what it is. Do you know there's people that don't know how to raise their children? I didn't know how to raise children. I grew up a drug addict. I did dope. And I got sober. I mean, my wife, she says, you were like raised by wolves. <laughs> well, you take that into trying raising little children that have never had the experiences I have. That's, a, that's not a good combination. So the relationship with my older two sons is more strained than it is with the younger ones. Because I didn't know what to do. I wanted to know what to do, but I didn't. I didn't, you know, and, I, and I've told Steve this since I met him, I marvel at his family. It's the real deal. <clears throat> 5.30 in the morning, I know where Steve's going to be. He's going to be on his couch with his wife and his Bible. And she's going to be with her Bible. And they're going to talk about, they're going to pray together what's going on that day. That's what's going to happen. That's what he does every day. He has this intimacy now. Now, he'll share the rest of his story. I mean, it's remarkable what God has done. But that's what they do every day, right? It's every day. Every day? Seven days a week? How do I know? I was there. One day I woke up, <laughs> and I came up, and I sat down. <laughs> and I'm like... <laughs> You know why? I wanted to see it. My wife and I don't do that every day. We don't have that intimacy that he does. I, I want that. And I want to see what it looks like. And we've been together 27 years. The marriage is fine. We're fine. Right? But I want more. I want, I want what he has. So, so it's teaching, it's modeling. The faster we grow, I wrote this down somewhere and I need to cross it off, otherwise I'll go over it again. Steve's going to come up and, and share something for five minutes. Uh, he's a nice guy, he asked me instead of just jumping in. The last thing before he says something, is that this needs to be done eyeball to eyeball. Discipleship needs to be done directly. It's not going to be done through emails. You can use text and you can text and stay in contact, but there's no substitute for getting together eyeball to eyeball. It's essential for buying in or helping some believe you that, you that you know what you're talking about. You're telling the truth. So, okay. Hi again. I want us to go back about 15 minutes. Pastor Randy's up here, and just before he called break, he gave you a word about our daily habits at home with my wife and I. Sorry. And I'm sitting back here in this chair listening, and I'm honored by what he's saying. At the same time that I'm seeing and hearing what he's saying, excuse me, what I'm hearing, what he's saying, it's what I'm seeing is what I want you to go back to from 15 minutes ago. A sweetness of spirit 
with conviction came over this room like we haven't seen since we started here yesterday. It was a conviction on almost every single one of your hearts. <clears throat> you want to be in that place, but you're questioning how you get there. It was a conviction of, without actually uttering the words, there was a conviction of repentance for not doing that and not sitting with the Lord the way that your heart bore witness so strongly 15 minutes ago as to what your relationship with your Lord ought to look like. You realize it's that position that launches you? It's that very position that we had 15 minutes ago of position of heart where every word that's spoken here and every prayer that's uttered for another person is going to be felt and manifested, launched. I just made a choice. Through my own hard knocks and by having a great spouse, I just made a choice. And we have committed ourselves to spend the first 45 minutes of our day together as husband and wife in the Lord's presence before we get into the chaos of six kids and a job and homeschooling and everything else that we do. It was just a choice. <laughs> so I talk about priorities. I would begin there and allow the Lord to retrace your steps back 15 minutes ago when Randy shared the testimony and allow that conviction, that spirit. I, the, the atmosphere changed in this room. This went from a workshop to a service real quick. The Holy Spirit showed up, and it was just powerful to sit back here and just watch the whoo, come across the room. And it was here, and we did take the break, but that doesn't mean it has to end. Just bring it right back in again. But for a moment there, the like-mindedness and the spiritual move in here, it was thrilling. You guys have this, and the Lord is here. He's walking in the aisles here for every one of us. If you let him, be expecting, I promise you, it's going to get real exciting in here. The, uh, the beginning of anything with God is going to start with you. God doesn't have a Kickstarter on you. Vroom, vroom. Nope. It was their feet, it was their hands, it was their mouth all through history. The Lord gave instruction, but mankind made the move. I was ministering in Honduras, and people were getting healed. I mean, like, real miracles were happening, and it was, it was so exciting that <clears throat> I forgot they were speaking their Spanish. And so I'm just, rah, 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 they're like, stop. They don't know what you're saying. <laughs> so I just forgot. It's there for everyone. You're ministering full time. It's there. It just might not be how we, how we think. It may not be on the parameters that we put on him. <clears throat> Many of the most God moments have happened when I didn't have anything to do with it. Can you imagine? It is, it is really our intimacy with the Lord that allows, opens the channel, the avenue for things to happen. Jesus Christ was with his apostles and then he went away, was intimate with the Father and came back and he knew what to do. We're the same way. He will lead you and guide you. He'll show you things to come. We're supposed to know that. 
it's I did say yesterday that the church service is only a portion of the church of what we do. And if you whittle down your influence to just a couple hours a week, that's the that's the impact you're making. I'm not saying you're doing that here. I'm just saying that if that's all the church is, then come on. <clears throat> Do you have more? I just believe you have more. I'm going to go preach around y'all. Well, that, that brought that presence back in, right? We're, 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 we're in a different spot. Yeah, are you feeling it again? So yeah. we, we respect the Holy Spirit of what he's doing, right? So if there's more, there's more. It is an honor beyond words to be standing in front of you in here. But it becomes a supernatural honor when the Lord honors what we're doing here. And his anointing's in here right now. And I would imagine this would be a fine time for us to get real humble and real transparent before the Lord. And if you've got any needs... Or if you've got a prayer request, for those of you that have so humbly come forward that you have something you want to accomplish in your life and you're wanting the Lord to move for you, today, this word is fulfilled in your presence. Isaiah 61. Today, the eyes of the blind are opened. Today, the chains break off. I would divide waters and create dry lands because of my passion for you, my love, and my tenderness, my absolute devotion and attention is on you. If you settle into my arms, if your adoration, your worship, and your praise become the priority of your heart. My promise is that I will manifest myself to you. That I will walk in your midst. I will show you things that are yet to come. And I will fulfill things in <coughs> your life that there is no way you could possibly imagine. The requests and the demands of your heart, the desires, of what you want to see come to pass in your life. Every need met in abundant measures are on the doorstep of your heart. If you open your heart to me and simply receive what has always been there and offered, simply receive from my hand in my rest, and in my presence, 
the work and the tarrying stop. Your effort, your exhaustion, your cares and concerns fade off. <clears throat> they fall off. I am with you, says your Lord. Always guiding, always coaching, and ever present in your sight. Ever present in your sight. Ever present in your sight. Lift your eyes and see me. See me and know me so that I may direct your path. Every need met, every dream fulfilled, to the Father's glory. Hallelujah. The Lord, right now, if you get into your hearts, the Lord right now is ministering to those needs, to the things that your heart is demanding, to the vision that the Lord has placed on your hearts, the Lord is giving you steps to progress, to advance. He is revealing himself, and he is making himself known. And he says, do not sit idle. Do not hold back in fear. But step up. Start. And I will finish. Just start. And I will be your finisher. Begin. What's he speaking? Just from my perspective, I, uh, when I asked you guys to come here, um, there was some personal things. I knew that anyway. You guys know a little bit about that, particularly on Steve's side with the, some financial things. But <clears throat> what I'm coming to find out is that um, from a pastoral perspective, and I know this is true just from, and it doesn't have to be a pastoral perspective, but a fivefold ministry perspective. There are so many of us in this leadership capacity that, like Dean says, an aching void of un underachievement, you know, that feel so empty. And I know I'm not alone. Thank you, Father. So the best way that I can say it personally is that what God has done in us 
to get us to five-fold ministry, because that seems to be the goal for a lot of people. And I really didn't know what I was asking for, to be honest with you, but he allowed it and he chose it. But there's so much more for everybody. This is for everybody. And my heart is delighted. So it's not tears of sorrow. It's just a, kind of a brokenness right now, and I'm not ashamed of it. So, But there's so much we've left on the table. There's so much from a leadership perspective, from a financial perspective. There's so much that we've left on the table. And we're trying not to run out of time. Let the fivefold hold me accountable to the word of the Lord. That's number one. Number two, try not to run out of time. Don't do anything in your own works. Number three, the Lord says there's greatness in this room. Greatness. There's greatness in this room. You have so much to offer that you have yet to even recognize or to see. There is so much potential in you, and there is such a hunger in your heart. And the Lord is going to honor that. He is going to see you through every step of the way and use you for multitudes. There's greatness in this room. Do not be guilty of selling yourself short on potential. Not a single one of you. Do not do anything in your own works. Love the Lord your God and be obedient. You're not done. You're not even close to being done. You're only just beginning. There is so much coming ahead of you. It's going to accelerate because we are up against time. Don't kick down any doors. You don't need to be making any phone calls. It's coming to you. It will roll out on your doorstep. As the Lord just spoke, the doorstep of your heart, just open your heart to it and receive what he has for you. The doorstep. Welcome to a workshop. This is what happens when God shows up. Look in the right spots, Robin. Look at, look at the right spots. I gotta say, this is this is why we're here. This is, this is we can go over the X's and O's, but this is God's family, God's kingdom, His way of doing things. We need to be about his vision, about his mission. We need his revelation to do it. If you're doing something without the revelation of God, quit doing that. Stop it. If, it, if the, he didn't say do it, stop doing that. Maybe some things you can't stop right away, but get out of it. If you really want the Holy Spirit working Either you work, he rests, or he rests and you work. You pick. I don't want anything to do with myself. I want to be obedient. I want to study, show myself, prove, but I don't want to do it myself. I want him to show up. Live transformation happens. Then. 
Where there's no vision, the people perish. Proverbs 29.18 So, what are you doing here? What's your vision? Why are you messing around with anything that is not included in that vision? Because that is chaff that's going to be burned up. There's, there's more than enough. I mean, look what Jesus Christ did with 13 guys and then 70 guys and then 120 guys. There's more than enough here to do, to accomplish his purpose. <clears throat> Why do you exist? What makes you, what makes your ministry different from others? Who are you? What are you about? What should be happening? What should be happening? What's really happening? What makes up the difference? What's your platform? Some people don't even like their platform. They don't like the the gift God's given them, and then they poo it. Well, stop doing that. But I want to do that. Well, that's not what he's given you. So be joyful, be grateful for what you have been given. We do... Probably 85% of things right. Pretty good. It's that other 15% that impedes us from breaking through. It's that little leaven that spoils the whole lump. Purity is a pathway to power. If you want God's power, it's purity. Otherwise, there's no power. Purity is the pathway to power. Now, he says in Ephesians, more than we can ask or think according to the power that works in us. What's more than you can ask or think? I start almost every class that I have at River City Recovery with the same question. What are we doing here? Why are we here? And I get all kinds of silly answers. And they're used to it. But we're here to recover. That's why they're here. We're here to recover. That's why we're here. Let's never lose sight of why we're here. Why are we here? I'm here because... There is a void and real, genuine discipleship. And somebody's got to fill that. And, and I've come to fill that. Where you can experience eyeball to eyeball. Where I don't know how to do things right. I don't, I don't care how to do things right. Meaning how you're supposed to do them. It makes me no difference. I believe to be innovative, you follow the Holy Spirit and then you do what He says do. In our recovery ministry, I don't copy Teen Challenge. I don't copy anybody else. I go to the Lord and then we do what He says. <clears throat> and what He says seems to work. So when you have your ministry, when you have your thing, you go to the Lord and you don't copy someone else. I mean, you can't have ideas. Of course you can have ideas, but that's not what you're looking for. I don't know what they, they, before we got here, Pastor Tommy says, do you have an evaluation form? I sat there and I'm like, what is that? I didn't know what it was. I finally uh, had a bowl of popcorn and I'm like, I just had to tell them I don't know what that is. 
I don't have one of those. It doesn't matter. And then Steve goes, I got one that's good enough for both of us. I'm like, well, good. It's okay not to know stuff. This is why we have a team. This is why you work at a team, because I don't know stuff. He doesn't, I love when he goes all prophetical. It's awesome. This is, you know, you, do you have, is, is this is what your, you, is this what your team looks like? Does your team do this? We don't talk. We didn't talk about this meeting at all. Well, you're going to do this. And we're gonna, until we started, five minutes before we started, we didn't know who was going to go first last night. He's like, I think we should figure that out now. So I want to do a one, uh, the time we have left here, we have 40 minutes. I want to do an exercise that doesn't get everybody sweaty because it's, it's really hot here again. But it's called automatic agreement. And I want you to think about what you want to do again, how you are going to do it. Now, from what I've heard, uh, Caleb wasn't the only one who didn't, know where how to concretely write down what he's doing we need we need to get as focused as we can about what we want want to have happen in the next you know six months goals that we want and there's going to be a number one then there's going to be a number two so number one will start out and they will say their goal to number two Number two, we'll encourage them about it. And that's some fun. Then, they're gonna, we're going to do it again. This will just be like a minute or two. And then, number two is going to discourage them about what they want to do. And then, number two will ignore them completely about what they want so I'd like you if you, you know try and match up man and woman or man and woman, woman and woman man and man um, if you can't that's fine um, but what I'd like you to do is is uh, Randy could you come help me just a second <clears throat> grab a chair uh, if you can I'd like you to zip her up what does that mean? Uh, face me. Right? And so you know how a zipper goes like this, right? So we want to zip her up. <laughs> and then talk this way. Face to face. Eyeball to eyeball. <laughs> eyeball to eyeball. So you would start out, what do you want? What do I want? Yeah, space. <laughs> um, clearer vision of what the Lord wants me to do. Okay. And then I'll, I'll be encouraging, oh, okay, well, great. What does that look like? And who's involved in it? And, and that sort of thing. Okay. Think we can do this? Huh? How do you ignore him when you're zippered up like that? Yeah, you'll find out. <laughs> so he needs a partner. <laughs> he needs a partner but go ahead and and uh, everybody do this mix together everybody get together zip her up together <clears throat> this the <clears throat> but it, but if you if you're married not not one another you know, and if it happens to be, you know, you have to do a man and woman, of course, don't zip her up. Just kind of knee up. Those guys. Those guys. Yeah, so once, once everybody gets zippered up, But well, those two are good. 
Zach needs somebody. All right. So we all ready? We're going to start that way. I have it timed right. Okay. So one, two, three. Number one is going to be on the left. Okay, everybody listen quick. If you're talking, you're not listening. Number one is going to be on the left. Number two is going to be on the right. Okay? So we're going to start with number one on the left. They're going to tell the vision. And what I want number two to do is agree. Steve, this guy, he's like a third wheel here. He was like when I was sitting in your worship or time, meditate time with your wife. <clears throat> He, he, Zach needs needs a partner. So number one. So we're ready, set, go. All right, we'll give it like another 30 seconds on the agreement. Okay, so now number one, you keep telling your vision, but number two, you discourage them. Be discouraging. The encourager will now be the discourager. Okay, now ignore them. Number two, ignore. You got to keep saying your vision, but number two has got to ignore. Okay. Okay, stop. All right, let's stop. Stay, everybody. Now let's switch roles. So number two, you tell your vision. Number one, you encourage. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Okay, discourage. Be discouraging. Discourage. The number two. <laughs> no, number one is going to discourage. Keep discouraging. All right. Now ignore. Number one, ignore. Probably another 30 seconds. So we'll stop. So stay where you are. Does anybody want to share what happened? <laughs> yeah, we're going to do one more, so we got to we got to stay where we're at. Anybody want to share what happened? What happened? We made a connection, like hardcore. We found out stuff we didn't know about each other, which is awesome. But I think the hardest part was probably when we had to discourage each other. That was hard because we share interest and what our passion is, what our desire is. And when we had to ignore, that, that yeah, that epically failed. <laughs> yeah, we still listened. You so, broke the rules. Yeah. <laughs> this is di very difficult for me because I don't like to be up close and intimate with anyone except for my wife. Um, but just to hear the vision really awoken something in me as well, brought about a passion in me to hear someone else is someone else's vision, you know, sparked that in me. And it was uncomfortable for me to discourage his vision. Uh, I will say this. It, uh, being a discourager is uncomfortable. I'm actually writing a book called The Power of an Encourager. But being discouraged enlarged my courage for my vision. 
I was like, I don't care, you know, talk to me. I actually got strength by being discouraged. So I was glad to hear somebody didn't agree. After, after she had just told me she did agree. Excuse me. <laughs> Double-minded. Okay. When it came time for uh, Janice to start discouraging me, it was like, you know what, I, I really don't care what you really have to say. I'm going to love you anyway. But then the, reality, the thought came through my mind was, I bet there's a lot of people in this room that has been have, receiving discouraging words, not, not keeping it, but hearing discouraging words from family, from friends for years saying, oh, you can't do that. And that's one of the thoughts that came through my mind is I'm used to being discouraged, or not being discouraged, but people trying to discourage me. So I'm used to it, so I was able to, you know, brush it off. But I wonder about other people. So I know him too well. But <laughs> the, the thing about, uh, I would say, being ignored is e even if you ignore me and I say what I got to say, if you don't listen, God's going to listen. That's my biggest thing is... Once I speak it out there and I'm getting it out there, it's going to be done even if you don't want to hear me. So that was my biggest thing is even though I know him, I'm still going to keep talking because God's going to hear me and it's going to get done because I believe it and I'm speaking it out there. So, so it was really cool because um, like him and I had the same vision. And so it was cool because that way we could come in an agreement with each other since it was the same type different premises and whatnot, but the same type. So we can encourage one each other because in a way we're going through the same path. And another thing too that I, I just realized was like when the discouraging part came, it, w it was kind of like what you've said with the bus. It's like, all right, fine. You can help me and encourage me and be along and share in the blessing of it in whatever way God's to show it. Or there's another trail you can blaze right over there. Because if you're going to be discouraging and negative in my life, uh, there's the door. Don't let it hit your fit point of contact on your way out. No, I, I think one of the things that happened on the being ignored part is that you had, and, and it kind of relates also back to having been a mother and having kids, is even if they are trying to ignore you, they're still hearing what you say. Mm -hmm. But I want, them, I want that. I want the opposition to hear me. I want the opposition right. to, yeah. to disagree with me. Because I'm not talk, I'm not doing this for them, you know. I'm doing this because we're talking my vision. I'm doing this because it came from God, and I'm I'm going after this. This is not for you. Can participate, fine. But you said something, and you said it a couple times. You know, we're going to get to two fifty. You said about you know you can you can join up or you know okay we love you and keep on going but that's really personal my vision is starts in me it doesn't start with whether they agree or not so. right. it's easier said than done in this little setting but when reality hits it hits hard in our region just be a little bit transparent um, you know Bishop Roberts came and affirmed me as an apostle back in October I'm one of the first apostles affirmed in that region. And there's a group of pastors who got together, including my leader, and began to talk about it. And they all got together and said that they were not going to come and affirm to my affirmation service. It hurt. It hurt and was disappointing because they could not see or they, they don't see what God has and what God is doing in me and they're looking at it as competition versus as advancing the kingdom mm -hmm. so that was real and it hurt my feelings mm -hmm. and then God had to remind me that who am I doing this for mm -hmm. I begin to get disgruntled and begin to you know share with them but it hurt it was disappointing that the people were yoked in ministry with disagreed and, and talked about the vision and so it's easy in, in this setting but in reality, you know, it could be kind of disappointing. You know, um, Pastor Randy, the, the one thing that, uh, as I listen to everybody 
I'm probably not as spiritual as most of y'all, but um, I had to uh, I had to intentionally focus on who Ricky is, you know, and I think about because I wanted to do this with my wife because, like you said, that's my intimacy partner. But I I wonder if I would have done the same thing with her that I did with you. Because I have a tendency to treat people different that I know versus I don't know. Yes. And, and so I, I'm, I'm going to have to do a better job of seeing the person, not just hearing the vision, but knowing the person. Because I'll never support your vision if I don't know you. I'll never support your vision unless I know you. This is the type of exercise I don't care for. <laughs> <clears throat> but God spoke to me through it, saying that's what I've called you to do. I feel that my calling is to share my life's experiences with the brethren. I feel that they can gain from what I've been through. I dropped out of college because of speech class. I don't like getting up in front of people. But I forced myself to, and I feel that that's what God wants me to do. So, <laughs> Even though I don't care for this type of thing, I welcome it. That's your challenge. That's fabulous. <laughs> what was it like to say your vision so many times? Was it easy? It's hard? Well, the more she said it, the more I, I was like, I can't disagree with this. <laughs> That's the trouble I was having. It was just so strong. <clears throat> so, when you're saying your vision, you need to get a mirror and do it. Because that's the one who matters the most. Tell your vision to yourself in a mirror. Say, this is what's going to happen. You're like, oh, I got to listen to that guy. Because... That's who I listen to the most. Not what people tell me, right? So you get to say your, your vision. Um, I think we covered what was it like to be discouraged and what, but think this, and, and you hit it, the, one of the main objects of the lesson is how many relationships have we lost because we automatically agreed with someone just because of who they were, or we automatically disagreed and dismissed somebody just because of who they were without actually hearing. What lens were we wearing? Because I've heard Kyle a hundred times. Kyle's going to come and say this. So I'm not actually even going to listen. And, and you said it, it's intimacy with a spouse, with children. Are we really engaged? So we're going to do one more. This time, number one is going to start. You're going to do the same. Tell the vision again. But this time, number two, you cannot say anything. Listen. Actively listen. But don't say anything. Don't encourage. Don't discourage. Don't ignore. Just focus in and listen. Listen. And take it in, and then we'll then we'll switch and, and do it the other way. But this time, be number one, talking to number two, and don't say a word, just listen. If I hear anybody on this side say a word, I'll come slap you. All right, ready, go.
just a minute. We're getting what I see. We got a church in about seven weeks. Huh? What? Yeah, you get to keep going in at least two minutes. Okay, let's push a pause button. As you're listening, listen as if they've never said it before. Like, like this is a brand new thing. Like they've never said anything. They, you're not judging them on their track record, but they're actually just saying this for the first time. You're really hearing it. We'll go another 30 seconds here. Just another, this is a, number two, this is the first time they've said it. It's brand new. We're not going to prejudge. Isn't that great? All right, let's do it. Another 30 seconds. Number one, tell number two. <clears throat> Just listen. All right, stop, and then we'll switch. Go ahead and switch. Number two, number one, just listen. Listen like it's the first time you've heard it. It's brand new. No track record. We're almost there. Less than a minute. Okay. <clears throat> Hopefully, this has also helped people make some connection. So, what was this like? What is it like to say nothing? You heard more, you received more when you said nothing. I can tell you the steps. You know? Because it was easier to pick them up here that she put it in line. So when we're not thinking of what we're going to say, we can listen to what's actually happening. We can listen to their heart. We can listen to things that are not said. So maybe train yourself to shut your brain down that I don't have to answer. Some people think I'm stupid because I will listen, but then I don't respond. It's because I'm listening. They're like, he's a little slow. <laughs> but I'm really not thinking of what I'm going to say because I'm hearing what you have to say first. And then I'm going to understand it and then make a response. We don't have to just back and forth. 
right? What else about? You do it when you're married. It was, it was, it was difficult. So it was, it was hard to just listen. For the person that is speaking, if that person is not trying to respond back, but is basically giving you that undivided attention, it's more affirming because you've got their, they're really giving you their attention. Yeah, and it's an encouragement just to have somebody really listen to what you have to say. Exactly. Now think about this in discipleship. When you're discipling, when you're eyeball to eyeball and you're doing that and you're listening and you're focused in, you're not like, you know, on what else is going on, but you're, 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 you're in. It shows me care. Yeah. Yeah. I, I agree, but I fully know that that's a learned behavior. And in a society that does not like the engaging, the zipper effect, it becomes distinctly more challenging. Look, you're trying to see how zippered we are. I see what you're doing. But the reality of it is, is that it is a learned behavior, and the church has not been properly taught that. And unless we exercise what we taught, we're going to go back to being dismissive and not, not ever get an understanding that this is a person sitting in front of me. And I don't care what he brings to the table or she brings to the table. It is not my job to judge. It is my job to engage and hear. And then Holy Spirit will take care of everything else that flows. But it is a learn. You have to practice. My, I said that. I was, I was <coughs> trying to be flip when I said that about my wife. But I know my wife. We've been married for 35 years. And I, my job is to respond. She does not just like to hear herself talk. If she's talking, she has, no, I'm serious about this because she's got, she's got, she has ideas. And be, when we marginalize one another, we usually do it with those people that are closest to us. Or the people that try to get close to us and then they stop trying because we stop listening. That's, that's my point, Sam. You're absolutely right. You have to do this intentionally. Everybody put your arms out like this. And then bring them together, put one thumb on top. Any, either thumb. Which thumb landed on top? It's going to be the right or the left. <laughs> now, go back and make the other thumb land on top. What did you have to do? You have to think. So you have to be intentional about what you're saying. How you're listening. You have to intentionally do that. I want to say this. I've, been on, I've thought about this from both sides of listening in terms of as a leader okay some people are intimidated in talking to me some people will not i have to go to people i have to go find them i've after church some sundays i've been here and i'm not the pastor but i've seen visitors and i've run to them to talk to them as they're getting ready to leave and I've introduced myself to say hey you know what's your name and i'd like to t say hello to you thanks for coming that kind of thing on purpose and I could clearly tell the one person I talked to the last time I like, was so nervous, so uncomfortable, so unprepared for my approach. And I said, you know, it's cool. You know, I just want to say hi, you know. Yeah, no did big you deal. tell him your name's Walter? Yes. That should have did yeah. it right there. Hey, what are you talking about? <laughs> but the other side of it is, from my standpoint, I have also been challenged by certain things. Sometimes, I'm going to get to the real nitty gritty, sometimes people's breath stink. That challenges, yeah. that challenges me. That's when so you step I have to, to the left. I have to deal with that. So, sometimes they are not, they're standoff to the, to the, I got, I got to deal with pursuit, pers yeah. their pursuit of them and on purpose. Yeah. So, so, and he said intentional. I mean, that's really, but I've seen it both ways, you know. I, it's hard when people are running from you because they're intimidated, you know, but yeah. it's harder when you... I don't want to, I don't, I'm sorry, I want y'all to get a breath mint, you know, I want y'all, if I hand you one, I want you to take it, that kind of thing. <laughs> so if you ever get a breath mint from the bishop, your breath stinks. It was... 
it was hard for me to sit here and just listen to her, not because I wasn't wanting to listen or that, you know, but because I like to ask questions because sometimes when a person says something, another person can receive it in a whole totally different way, especially in a church where you come from many cultures and they're used to doing something or saying something. Actually, it's, it's right along the same ways that I would do it, but they call it or refer to it in a different way. And the way they say it, it, it might sound kind of offensive, but it really isn't. So that's why I, I, I ask questions just to draw out more of what they're trying to say. So just, just listening was a little difficult. Good point. And I, I learned a technique called facilitative listening uh, years ago, and I'm not that good at it, but you yeah. ask questions yeah, because the, the other person, by restate. <laughs> yeah, okay. They tell me that all the time. <laughs> The other person, the other person that you're listening to, by restating it different ways, it clarifies it in their mind, so they can. Because a lot of times, what people want to do is for is just to sp speak it out. And, and right, how many people do you know want to be heard? <laughs> right. But listening, listening is situational. Too, it's as much situational as. You know, every situation is every situation is different. You know, I mean, this is an intentional exercise. But again, you know, what am I hearing? Even from the nonverbal standpoint, what am I hearing? What am I seeing? What am I receiving? So it's a situational thing, like like you said, facilitative listening. It, it's one of those things that we, I believe, we'd have a greater impact, especially with with our life groups that are getting ready to start by just looking around the room and hearing what people are saying, not ready to pounce on a lack of doctrinal understanding, not ready to pounce on a, a hot button, you know, or even avoid a hot button issue. You know, that's what, that to me is what the Spirit of God in us is, is more about than just speaking in tongues. Exactly. You know? So if we're going to coach, teach, train, mentor, if we're going to delegate, empower, and entrust people, we need to listen in order to do that effectively. Otherwise, we're making our own assumption on what they are and wonder why they don't perform to what they should. Uh, one of the things that I've known to have done, has been done to me and I've done to other people, is even if someone's right there face to face with you looking dead in your eyes, they could be off somewhere else in their head. Even though they look like they're listening intently, even can be repeating sometimes some stuff they say, they're still not hearing you and not understanding. You so, know of some horrible people. Yeah. <laughs> it's life experience. But uh, it goes almost to what uh, Robin was saying. To have someone ask questions and to you know try and get a deeper understanding of what you're saying shows that they're really, really listening and Engaged. really trying to, you know, understand exactly your ideas and your concepts so it is sometimes kind of hard because you do sometimes wonder you know even looking someone dead in their eyes are they truly getting what i'm saying or are they just standing here off in la la land in their head you know but i mean waiting for you to go away right exactly yeah so and also sometimes too depending on the person i know this isn't uh usually the thing but sometimes like when i was talking to him I saw something out of the corner of my eye, so I looked real quick. I mean, some people that just, I was still listening to them intently. I can almost tell them back to it verbatim. Then again, I know them. Um, but sometimes it's like, me, I continually scan. That was because I was in the military, so I was trained that way. And so sometimes it's those things, it's, but I'm still listening to them. So, I'm sorry? Yeah. So if somebody yeah. doesn't know you, You'll have to say, I've been in the military, and while I'm listening to you, I'm going to look at everything else. Yeah. I, but but I'm some, listening. And, I, and I've, and I've had I'm to do engaged. that before. But I've had to do that before. I've had, when somebody's like, is there something wrong? I'm like, no, I apologize. You know, I've, it's, it's unintentional. It's, it's habitual. I have, yeah. it's because of You're my training. You're a little training. weird. Thank you. <laughs> That's a compliment. Yeah. I mean, I like you, but you're a little weird. <laughs> you know, it's okay to be honest with people, right? Yeah. Can we be done now? 
Um, we're going to be, uh, I think we're going to be done. We have a minute. <clears throat> Thank you all for participating. Um, yeah, you did have a choice. There's always a choice. There was a choice to leave the room set up the way it was, and there was a choice to change it. There's a choice to go touch the wall, or there's a choice to touch the wall or just stand there. There's always a choice. It's always your choice, what you do, how you act, whether you listen, whether you don't listen. This is all our the keys of the kingdom have been given to us. Amen. Well, Father, we just thank you for your presence. We thank you for what you're doing here. We thank you for the, for the understanding, the competence, the growth, what you're pouring into us here that can be exercised, implemented, evaluated, and grown that life point affect this community, this area, be involved and be an important portion, an important part of, of what's going on here in Iowa, that, it's, that it is a light on a, shining on a hill, that it is something to, to look up to, that it is where lives and people are transformed, where people are discipled, and where your name is magnified. In Jesus' name, thank you for coming. Amen.